All right, Pop. Let's hear it. What year were you born? I was born in 1944 during the Second War. Our only salvation is not Jesus. Our only salvation is Brad Pitt. One of the things I talk to people about is belief. Why do they believe the things they believe and why do they change their mind? So the first thing I ask you is how did you change your mind? And I know you've told me this story before about when you were a little kid going to church. So if you don't mind, could we start in your early childhood? This is Michael Beverly. Welcome to my YouTube channel. On St. Patrick's Day 2024, I did an interview with my father. Um, for those of you that know that I was raised a Christian and might be wondering about my atheist father, my, my parents divorced when I was little. So yeah, I always, you know, I grew up know, knowing as I got a little older, I knew my dad was an atheist. But by the time I knew what an atheist even was, I was already sold on Jesus and a hardcore Christian. Yep, we moved out of San Diego when I was one year old and moved to East Los Angeles and lived there for a couple of years. And then my parents bought a house in Downey, California, in a place otherwise known as Dog Patch. And I know you've told me this story before about when you were a little kid going to church. So if you don't mind, could we start in your early childhood? When I was about seven years old, my brother Doug was about 10 years old, uh, we were sent off to a church. And the reason we were sent off to it is because in the neighborhood I live, Dog Patch, uh, one of the people, one of the families that lived there decided they wanted to have a church in their yards. So they, they bought a war surplus tent and put it up and put sawdust down for a floor and they made a bunch of benches. And they had a preacher come in and, and uh, yell and scream at everybody and then collect money every Sunday. Well, the authorities got after them because it wasn't zoned. The area there was not zoned for having a church. So a church in North Downey, which was more civilized and upmarket than South Downey, than Dogpatch, uh, decided to do something for the children of Dogpatch. So they proposed busing the kids once a week on Sundays from Dog Patch to Downey to go to a church. <clears throat> so to do that, we had to have new clothes, new shoes, haircuts, which uh, my mother provided. And she gladly sent us off to church on Sunday and she gave us each a quarter, a coin. A quarter was a lot of money in those days. That was around you know, the early 50s. Especially to a kid, a quarter was a lot of money. So Doug and I got dressed up, and we went out and waited for the bus. We got on the bus, and it was about a two- or three-mile trip to this church. We went in the church, and we listened to some old man rant and rave. And then they put a basket. Uh, they passed the basket around, and they told everybody to put their money in a little envelope. So... We put. We didn't know what was going on. We put the 25 cents in the envelope. And then afterwards, we left. And on the way back, on the way back from the church, my brother Doug said, hey, look at that, Steve. I saw this on the way in. There was a little store, a mom and pop store that the church went by, that the bus church bus went by. And the bus stopped there and dropped some kids off. And I, I assume it picked some kids up on the way to the church in the morning. And my brother said, I have an idea. My idea is next week we stop at that store instead of going to the church. We'll each have a quarter. We can do a lot with a quarter. So I said, yeah, that's a great idea. So the following week we got buffed out. In our new clothes and new shoes, we were each given a quarter. We were sent off to the bus stop to catch the bus to go to church. It stopped in front of this little store to pick up some kids. Doug and I got off the bus. We went into the store and we bought ice cream, candy bars, sodas, and we were in heaven. So... We just spent the next hour 
dining on these uh, kid foods, penny candies with the change. We were very happy. We did it again the following week. Nobody said anything. The third week, the bus driver stopped, wanted to know where we lived, went to our house and ratted on us, told our mother what we had done. So that was it. We never went to church again. And that was my epiphany. I may have believed in God and what the old guy at the church was saying, but here's what I believe from that day on. What kind of God would rather have children listen to a stuffy old man rant and rave than have them be happy and go in a store and buy ice cream bars and candy? That no kind of God I want to know. So seven years old, I crossed God off my list. That, so it was, it was just not a... It, it either wasn't believable or wasn't palatable. It didn't matter. Either one. Either yeah. one. It wasn't for me. And so I'm sure in high school and as you were a young adult, there must have been people that either preached to you or told you you had to believe or did that ever happen where somebody tried to talk not, to you? Not just in high school. Well, the last time was just last night. Oh, really? Last night someone tried to convert you? <laughs> Your sister. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Really? No. Well, Jesus Christ, exactly. <laughs> yes, she told me that... Is that true, Lisa? She told... She, but anything you say is going to be recorded. My daughter told me last night that uh, just before I died, would I accept Jesus as my personal Savior? Of course, I said no, because there is no Jesus. Well, Jesus it's, it's Pascal's myth. wager, though, maybe, just in case. The Pascal's wager, just in case, I brought that up. Pascal's wager, you boil it down to just a few words, is that if on your deathbed you say that you believe in Jesus on the off chance that he exists, and belief in him will send you to heaven. Jesus is all-knowing. So he knows you're lying. You're going to go to hell anyway. <laughs> so what's the point? The point well, is you should be true to yourself. Well, okay. And if I, you don't believe in something, keep that up. Say that right until the very end. I'm not going to say I believe in Jesus to try and get a ticket into heaven. No, I won't do that. That's fair enough. I remember once when I was still a Christian... And I told you about Anthony Flew, and you said, no, he's just an old man who was scared on his deathbed and said some stupid shit about God. Do you remember that? Yeah, well, vaguely. Remind yeah, he, me. Well, Anthony Flew was a famous atheist who, when, he's gotten, go, when he was getting close to death, he decided he believed that there must be a God there, or that God exists. Not Christianity per se, but just that. And I had told you about that because I was always trying to tell you th reasons why you should believe in God. And you said, no, he's just an old He's just an old man, and you know he's dying. So, it, it that he changes his mind that late in life didn't matter. I remember when. I remember when my when my mom was all excited because she baptized her father when he had cancer and he was almost near death, and and I said, yeah, I don't care, and she said. You should be happy your grandpa's saved. And I said, not really. You know, like, and <laughs> what kind of program is that that he can be an asshole his whole fucking life? And then at the last minute when he's about to die, he can, you know, get off scot free. I, I never really cared for that system myself. So you never, you never, you never entertain thoughts that an afterlife or a hell were real? Uh, no. And I, I have an alternate theory about that as well. All right, let's, let's hear it. Okay, uh, the, the most read and quoted verse in the Bible is St. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, who whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have life ever after. Ever, ever after. Pardon me for the mumbling. I just had an operation on my face. Sorry, right. uh, we'll, we'll let you slide this time. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, if you live forever... When you die, you're still alive. What's another way of saying that? Undead. You're undead. Right. And who else or what else is undead? Well, there's two things that pop to mind right away. Zombies and vampires. Ever. If you believe in Jesus, you will live forever. It says so in the Bible. Live forever means you're not dead. 
Another way to say not dead is undead. Who else is undead? Zombies and vampires. So another way you could you could paraphrase St. John 3.16 goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Count Dracula. And if you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, you will live forever. Unless somebody drives a wooden stake into your heart, a wooden stake into a vampire, a wooden cross to hang up a, a Jew. Yeah, the same thing. You live forever. Yeah. Or a zombie. You could be a zombie. You're undead. So heaven, in my idea, by definition of all the biblical things and all the rants and raves of the Christians, is someplace. And it's full of undead souls, undead people. And they're waiting for rapture so they can return to the earth. And when they return to the earth, what are they going to do? They're going to kill us all. That's what zombies do. Our only salvation is not Jesus. Our only salvation is Brad Pitt. <laughs> Fair enough. That's as believable as anything written in the Bible, oh, in my opinion. Well, yeah, probably more so. Did you ever read, you ever read, um, what was, the, what was, the, okay, you, you were the one that first turned me on to this old Charlton Heston movie called Omega Man. Yes. Omega Man got remade with Will Smith, I Am Legend, which is the actual name yeah. of the book. And in that one, he, he wrote, it's a scientific, it's, it's a it's a vampire story, but based on science. So it's like caused by a virus, and and the the reason the 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 vampires were afraid of crosses is only if they'd been a Christian. If they'd been a Jew, they were afraid of the Star of David, and et cetera, et cetera. So same kind of idea. Yeah. It's, so my point being is that story is actually more plausible because we know viruses happen and so forth. So. So at, at, at seven or so, you kind of decide religion and God believes not for you. But at that time in America, you couldn't really be an outspoken atheist, I assume. Like it wasn't like you were going around saying, I'm an atheist. Or, or is, am I wrong about that? Oh, you could, but you had to keep it amongst your, your peers. Don't tell adults that. And the peers would either go along with you or tell you you were wrong or they'd just laugh about it. And uh, I actually did that in high school once. I, I challenged God to show himself or, or don't ever try to convince me you exist at all, ever. And I, I came up with a way well, he never did, or it never did, she never did. So it didn't exist, in my opinion. But uh, I came up with a syllogism that's real simple. Uh, if God exists, I would know it. I don't know it. Therefore, there is no God. Seems reasonable enough. Three parts of the syllogism. Um, have you ever have you ever thought that maybe you were you were wrong? There's like a, a what is that? Holy water? Exactly. Holy, holy shit. <laughs> Somebody just brought us holy, my my brother in law brought us holy water. Mm. I, I don't know if he knows his his wife is trying to convert you secretly at night, but she means well. Um. So you're talking about your okay your syllogism about it, and I was going to ask you: Have you ever considered there's something else, like maybe a Thomas Paine creator god, or maybe a a super intelligence like a computer? No, like like some other. Have you have you read any physics books yeah. about like no, multiple they're, they're, universes or yeah 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 well, but, show me you know yeah okay like and that's what I said about yeah you know, when my daughter asked me to accept Jesus I said okay I'll do that on one condition he shows up in the morning and has a cup of coffee with me and she said he'll be here no no where he's invisible he won't be here because I invite him not every morning but. Several times a month, I invite Jesus to 
come in the morning and have a cup of coffee with me just for a minute or two. Does he ever show up? No. If he showed up, then I would believe that he doesn't show up. Well, that's a fair metric. Yeah. So there, it doesn't exist. And the other thing is, if you read deeply into it, there, there's a lot of stuff written about the gospel that the church has tried to suppress for years. Yeah. And T- tell me a little bit about your... So you, you left Downey after high school, and, yeah. you, and you moved to Hawaii to be a surfer and go to school and be a marine biologist, right? That's yeah. part, part of it. The okay. big reason I left Downey is because Downey, if you look on a map, it's a rectangle on a map. <clears throat> it's a suburb of Los Angeles, kind of. It's in L.A. County, and it's actually at the time, and probably still is, a ghetto. It's a, a, a white ghetto, and uh, surrounded on four sides by not so fortunate people as the people in Downey. And in Downey, uh, blacks were not allowed. They, they could drive through on two main highways, Lakewood Boulevard and Firestone Boulevard, but they had to come and go. They were not allowed to stop. They were not allowed to eat in restaurants, shop in stores, have friends, or do anything. Uh, that was horrific to me. Uh, and and my, this was a little before the civil rights movement. You're talking like yeah, 60, yeah, just a little bit before, a little 60. bit before. So I had heard about Hawaii. Hawaii was considered a melting pot. Yeah, uh, the people of Hawaii can be one person can have five or six different races. It can be Portuguese, Hawaiian, Chinese, uh, Caucasian, uh, Filipino, mm-hmm. in one person, and they get along. They all, for the most part, get along with each other. So to me, that would have been like a paradise to go there. So sure, I wanted to surf, I wanted to skin dive, I wanted to go to school there. I wanted to see all the girls everybody talked about. But the main reason I wanted to go there is because I didn't want to live in a white ghetto anymore. And Downey, like a lot of places in America, a lot of them still are white ghettos. Now I never knew that story about you. I I, yeah. I assume you want to go to Hawaii because it was girls well, and surfing and volleyball. I, I have a paper that I wrote when I was a freshman at University of Hawaii, and it was about it's the paper's called "What Are Human Races," and I'll uh, I'll get that. It's in oh. yeah. It's we with all it my me? stuff in in New Caledonia. It's, I'll, it's I'll get on, that. It's not online. No, you, it's not online. Okay, get it to me, and I'll no. put it online. Yeah. Okay, interesting. If you don't mind, I'll share it with people. I'll put a link. Yeah, sure. Very interesting. No, you just yeah. mentioned New Caledonia, so let's get people a little bit caught up. By the way, it is, I'm drinking Guinness because it's St. Patrick's Day. Uh, my dad's actually French. Um, well, my French and American. I'm a French citizen. French citizen, yes. Not French. You're a Brit by blood. But the reason I bring that up, he mentioned New Caledonia is where he's lived now for... 30 what, years. I was going to say, yeah, 30 years. About. Wow. Roughly. That's like half of my life. Yeah. I'm I'm going to be 60 next year. Yeah. I first first wow. time I went there was 1992. Hey, Where Where's Rodna? No, she can't hear what you got to yell real loud. Oh, I'll grab her later. Maybe she could just say hi. So anyway, so so my dad married uh, a native of New Caledonia and became they a French. They don't like the word native. Enough. Okay, sorry. The whole Pacific, they don't, they don't like, like the word native. What the fuck do they like? Well, native means you're making a Tarzan movie. Okay. And if you're not making a Tarzan movie, don't say native. Okay, I'm not making a Tarzan movie. What's the appropriate term? Indigenous? Indigenous. Okay, be just, yeah. okay, fine. My stepmother is indigenous of New Caledonia. No, which she makes, isn't. Fuck, what is she? I thought she was born there. She's born there. Doesn't That doesn't make her indigenous. Uh, well, okay. Her, so her, her, her father was born in uh, Java, in Indonesia. Okay. Her mother was born in New Caledonia, but her parents were from Java. Oh. So she was So okay. So basically she, an expat. Oh. People thought, from different, different places, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, were brought in to... Uh, New Caledonia to work in the nickel mines. The indigenous people there are called Melanesians. They're the first people that discovered the place okay. and settled it. Melanesian, Melanesia, the word Melanesia means black islands. There's three groups of islands in the Pacific. 
Melanesia, which is black islands, Micronesia, which means small islands, and Polynesia, which means many islands. So the people that live there are uh, Melanesians, and there's actually 32 different races, or not races, tribes, in six chiefdoms that live there. And they've okay. never actually got along very well. They have, each has its own separate beliefs and languages. And what's the, what does the term Kanaki mean? Is that... Kanaki is a Hawaiian word. It means man. But, Kanaka. But that doesn't, don't, isn't, I've read that that's, in New Caledonia, that's like that's a That's what they call themselves and they want to call the country, if it ever becomes a separate country, they want to call it Kanaki. Where did they get that? They had to find a name somewhere because they don't have a name. They don't have a name for themselves. They don't have a name for the land because they never got along. And they okay. still don't, and that's part of the problem. Well, how did they adopt a Hawaiian word? I don't know the story behind that, but for some yeah. reason they picked a Hawaiian word to describe themselves and their land. Okay. And the word is Kanaki. Interesting. Okay, but so there's a bunch of different tribes. They don't get along. And that's part of the reason that, that the island, basically a colony of France, has stayed colony, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it the, stayed French. Yeah, okay. And right now, well, the last vote, the last vote, the Kanakis boycotted the vote, so it was, it was skewed way in favor of the ones they call loyalists. It was about 96% to 4%. But typically, when they have a vote, they have them every two or three or four years, uh, it's about 50-50. Okay. And there's no way to settle that because what they don't have, and a big mistake, is that they don't have a trinity. Trinities are very important in governments, religions, anything. Trinity is one of the most important concepts that humanity ever came up with. And I can give you a bunch of examples of that. <clears throat> well, just, you... just give us an example of why it's important or why why it hurts them not having it there? Well, it hurts because, like I said, the vote most of the time has been 50-50, tied vote. You can't have a tied vote in a trinity. You you can have three to nothing, two to one. Okay, but oh, a counter to that would be in, in Northern Ireland, you have loyalists to England, you have loyalists to Ireland, and you have loyalists that want Northern Ireland to be its independent country. Yeah, that's a trinity. But, they, but they're still not, they haven't resolved it. Yeah, they haven't resolved it. But you're just saying it's easier to break a tie. It's easier to break a tie. And there's, there's hundreds of examples of trinities. In fact, they get pounded into our heads when we're little kids. And I'm sure you can think of a bunch of them. The one that comes to mind right away is the three little pigs. How is that a trinity? How is it a trinity? There were three of them. And each had his own opinion about how things should go. And the mm -hmm. one that won was the three little pig, the, the pig amongst the three that made a stone house. Okay. The wood house and the straw house didn't make it. The big bad wolf got them. Okay, that's one example. Another example is Goldilocks and the three bears. Okay, fair enough. So do you think, do you think the... Early church fathers that made the Trinity were, were doing it off of that same idea? Oh, I'm sure they were. Okay. You look at the, the U.S. government, it's based on a Trinity. Okay. The legislature, the executive, and the judicial. Right. It's ma based on a Trinity. Mm -hmm. the, you can't have a tie. Okay, fair enough. Oh, why, isn't, why aren't marriages Trinities? Wouldn't they be better? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, in a, that, in that a, case, the, the rule breaks down in that case? No, no. Well, what you, Trinity, what do you mean? Bigamy, one man has two wives? Yeah. Or That's could, possible, except yeah. that, uh, no, women actually control things. Men don't. So even if it's 50-50, it never really is. Okay, so it's sort and, of a Trinity. Anyways. Yeah, so. and there, there's a big flaw <laughs> in, in bigamy. Anybody who wants to have two wives should consider this and he would probably change his mind if you have two wives what else do you have two of uh, double all your problems no <laughs> well, mothers-in-law oh you don't want to have one you have two 
And two wives, that's horrible. You'll be outvoted all the time. Fair enough. But but if, if you're French, though, you're allowed to have like a, a lover on the side? Is that like legit or is that a rumor? It's not legit. It's not a rumor. And there's a word for it. It's called amant. But the word basically only applies to women who are married uh, are allowed to have a lover on the side. It's their amant. Uh, men can have a lover on the side, but they'd better hide it from the wife. Uh, but the wife doesn't have to hide it from the husband? Not necessarily. If she's wise, she will, okay. but not necessarily. It's their God-given right to have an amant. Really? Wow. Well, that's what that's, they think. That's what they say when they're in charge, so you better do yeah, what Yeah, they're in charge, so you got to go along <laughs> with it. Okay. Let's, let's go back to the Hawaii thing. So you started off, you taught... Okay, I remember as a kid just and just to just to just to give a little backstory here. So, I was raised most of my life by my Christian mother, which is why I was a Christian and not an atheist like my father because when my parents divorced, you don't have what? to wave your hand in front of the camera. Sorry. So, when <clears throat> my I was I was too young to really be thinking about the, these kind of things. And when I became when I became a Christian at, say, 10 years old, you really didn't have any say in it. And I know you weren't happy about it, but, you know, what the fuck can you do? And You're going to put the words like that in your... Yeah, this... this I, we can say fuck in my, oh, in my stream. It's no, fine. Okay. I mean, people don't like it if you cuss the whole time because it's just annoying, but a few times. Um, so, so, so we're, we're... Oh, we're going back to the... to the Hawaii thing. So, so... I remember as a kid these Pan Am plates because you were, didn't you you were a cook for Pan Am is that right? Yeah, I worked at Pan American. Uh, I was a cook in the. It's where the old the seaport used to be on the the back side of the the, the runway. But these were Especially meals to go in the plane, right? Yeah, and uh, anyway. They wasted a lot of stuff there. One one thing they wasted was plates and silverware, and everything. Mark Pan American Pan Am. So he's right. I did. We did have a lot of that stuff at home. It ended up in the rubbish at Pan American. You fish it out and take it home. Nice. And you at the time you were at UH studying. Yeah, right? I was a graduate student at UH when I when I was a cook at Pan American. Okay, and now. You were you taught at you taught at at Punahou right right before Obama was there or yeah, after in the Obama? early seventies. Obama was there, but he was in the junior school, and I taught in the upper school, which is uh, junior schools like junior high school or okay. intermediate, and the upper was like high school, but they're all on the same campus. So so we would have had a different history if you had taught Obama and been big friends and he thought you were a cool professor and like later in life you could call him up and say, remember what I taught you? But that didn't happen. It, it didn't happen and also I had as a student, uh, oh man, what's his name now? I can't remember even. Oh, Stephen Case, one of the richest men in the world, the owner of Time Warner. And that never helped you? No. I, if I got in touch with him, if there was a way to do it, uh, he wouldn't remember me. Maybe he did remember me, but he would deny that he ever knew me mm. because I don't fit in with his with his paradigm of what a decent human should be. Well, that sucks. Oh, of course it sucks. An example <laughs> of that is uh, Miss America at one time was uh, Miss Hawaii, and she was also a student of mine. And I went to a concert at the Blaisdell Center, and they announced that Miss America would be out in the lobby, and if you wanted to meet her and talk to her, you could, or get her to sign your program. Anyway, I went out there with the person that I was with at this concert, and I said hello to her, and I said, hey, do you remember me? And she said, no. And I said, well, you were a student of mine at Punahou for a whole year. She said, no, I don't remember you. Which was a lie. Of course, she. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't want to admit it, huh? She didn't want to admit it because I wasn't 
up there like she was now all of a sudden. Mm. I won't mention her name, but that's just the way things that's, are. That's how it was. Okay, so you you eventually, you I remember you worked at a school, like it must have been after this because I was a little bit older, that was like a, a harder school. Like the kids were bad kids kind of. Yeah, it was right. a school for kids with learning disabilities. Uh, it was called Honolulu Junior Academy. So like and, a private school? Yeah, it was a private school, and it was the campus was on a church. They rented the, the classrooms and all the facilities from this church, and the church used it on Sundays. The school used it on Monday to Friday. Okay, and and my memory is that you eventually got tired of teaching and you decided to do the one thing that you always wanted to do as a kid and that's fish because your dad never took you fishing yeah. is that is that a real story or is that yeah no that's that's part of it uh what i really got tired of is when when i went to school undergraduate school and graduate school i i worked to put myself through school i got very very little help from any family in fact the only ones that really helped me at all were uh, Michael's great grandparents, who lived in Beverly Hills, and they sent me a check every month, uh, and that was, that was a big help. That was a nice of them. Yeah, it was very nice of them, and that continued on until uh, Michael's mother and I went on separate ways. But they really helped me out. I wouldn't have been able to do it without their help. Anyway, I. I worked as a cook, and for years I was a cook at a restaurant called Tahitian Lanai, which was a very well-known restaurant in Waikiki. I did that for about oh, three or four years, and then I worked at Pan American for about three or four years, and then uh, I became a teacher. And much to my chagrin, I found out that as a teacher, I never made as much money as I made as a cook, oh. putting myself through school. I, right. I, I've heard variations of that same story. Uh, one of my friends, who was a teacher at uh, Honolulu Community College, gave a, an address at a meeting where they were talking about unionizing teachers. And uh, he was for it, because they needed some power. Mm -hmm. and. He was asked, why are they for it? He said, well, it's real simple. You pay the people that handle your garbage more than you pay the people that handle your children. Mm -hmm. Think about that. That's yeah. wrong. Yeah. It should be the other way around. But uh, to this day, it still exists. Even though tr teachers are treated and paid better than they were when I was a teacher. Yeah. Well, I mean, they have some strong unions now, so, so they get yeah. more money. So that, that was... Probably my main reason to get out of teaching is I wanted to do something else. And the part about the fishing, yeah, I always wanted to try commercial fishing in some form. But when I quit my teaching job, I quit in the middle of the school year. And it's almost impossible for a teacher to find a position as a teacher in the middle of the school year. Because the school year starts in September, ends mm -hmm. in June in America. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a job that starts in June. Well, if you quit your job in November, how long do you have to oh, wait? Sure. Months before you can get another job. So I went on unemployment. And in the unemployment office, they asked me what I wanted to do. And just partly as a joke, I said, all I really want to do is go fishing. And the lady who was interviewing me said, well... This is your lucky day. She pulled a card out of a box and handed it to me. And she said, go see this man down at Pier 17. Really? Yeah, and I went to see this man. His name was uh, George Oshiro. His, his nickname was Smokey. Smokey Oshiro. He had a fishing boat, and he was looking for a crew member for his boat. So I went down there and talked to him, and he hired me. So... That was my first... Uh, and, and this was a lobster boat? Or no, a this boat. was a long so, line, tuna long line boat. Oh, that was your first job was tuna? Yeah, my first job as a, wow. as a long line fisherman. And then you worked that a few years and then went... No, and then... I did one season and then, uh, you know, things happened fast. Uh, 
my friend Gary started the roofing company. Oh, Chicken Little. Chicken Little Roofing Company. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, his, his forte was shake roofs, cedar shakes, mm -hmm. which were very popular in Hawaii. And he was very good at it. So he hired me, and I worked for him for about oh, eight months or nine months. And then uh, <clears throat> the money was good, but then somebody told me, one, one of the guys that also worked at Chicken Little Roofing Company, a guy named Norman, said, hey, I know a lady who's the principal of the school, and she's looking for teachers. You might want to go talk to her. So I did. I went and talked to her. Her name was Dorothy, Dorothy Douthy. I talked to her, and uh, uh, she asked me why I left Puno, and I said it was a personal reason. And she said, well, the rumor is that uh, you were asked to leave because you were having sexual affairs with students. I said, well, that isn't true. I found out later where that rumor came from, by the way. and uh, That was my grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Michael's grandfather spread that rumor to punish me for one reason or another. Anyway, uh, Dorothy, at the time, had a long sleeve sweater on. And I asked her, you know, what, why do you believe me and you don't believe the, the rumors? And she said the same thing happened to her. She went into an interview and she wore a long sleeve sweater, and she always did because she was cold for some reason. Even when it wasn't that cold, she felt chills and she had to wear a sweater. So the rumor about her was that she was a drug addict and she wore a long sleeve sweater to hide the track marks. So she hmm. said, I'm on your side, I'll give you a chance. And so I got a job. And I did that for about five years. And then the itch to go back fishing came back, and uh, just by coincidence, a friend of mine was invited to go to a boat christening for a company called Easy Rider Corporation. And she invited me to go along. She said, you might be interested in this. So I went, went with her and uh, met the owner of the company, a guy named Skip, and uh, I told him I'd be interested to come and work for him. And he said, well, we have an opening on our smaller boat called Easy Rider also, but it's uh, the job is as a cook. And I said, ha. Oh. I was a cook for six or seven years putting myself mm -hmm. through school, so he hired me. And uh, I resigned from my teaching job and uh, went out fishing instead. And then that led to other things, led to working as a commercial diver and tugboat crew member, mm. and then uh, eventually a tugboat captain. And I, and I went and worked for you once when somebody was getting married. Remember yeah, that? My... Michael came and <laughs> went out on a... On Just like one little trip. Yeah, yeah. one trip, and uh, I thought it might stick with him, but it, it was different kind of work. It's not for everybody. Yeah, well, I would probably would have been... I probably would have had a better... Uh, <clears throat> a better career if I'd stuck with becoming a boat captain. But I went shrimp. I went shrimp fishing with George. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. But it is a hard. That's definitely a hard life. So, so then, so from the easy rider, you a cook. You is that when you started lobstering, or you went sword fishing next? Yeah, no. The easy rider was the first job was lobster fishing. Okay. And a, a funny thing happened there. Uh, the company. Uh, somehow they got a hold of this uh, agency in Korea. And in Korea, South Korea, not North Korea, uh, there was a program to take prisoners of uh, lesser crimes, not murder for sure, and not high dollar crimes, but to rehabilitate them by sending them to fishing school. Okay. In, uh, well, I can't remember where it was, Pusan maybe and then get them jobs on fishing boats. And Skip, the owner of Easy Rider Corporation, went to Korea and he hired 18 Korean fishermen who had been to the school, graduates of this fishing school. And most of them worked on the big boat, which was a catcher boat uh, processor. Mm -hmm. And there were boats, smaller boats that 
went out and caught lobsters and then turned them over to the processor boat to process. By processing, I mean to cut off their tails and freeze them. Okay. Because that's the big dollar in lobster is the tail. And on the Easy Rider boat that I was on, there were four Koreans. And my job, uh, it turned out, uh, I wasn't the cook for very long. They hired another cook. And they decided to use me to be the, the trainer of these Korean men. Now, I didn't speak a word of Korean. None of them spoke a word of English. Uh, so I had to improvise. And what I did is I bought two books, a Korean-English dictionary, and I bought a book on uh, sort of a, a Korean language book, you know, how to, how to say phrases. Mm -hmm. And it turns out Korean is a, what they call a primitive language, and that doesn't mean caveman. It means it's, it's, it's very simple. Like, it goes like this. Uh, there's one form of a verb, and if you want to put that verb into the past tense, you'd use the same one you use for present, but you say yesterday. And if you want to make it into the future, you use the same form of the verb, but you say tomorrow. So that's relatively simple. Wait, better than Spanish, which has like 50 no, million conjugations. No, better than French, which has 14 <laughs> conjugations. Way more so, than Spanish. So, so I'm assuming a lot of your teaching was like monkey see, monkey do. No. I, I mean, would, when yeah, you were I showing would, them how to I do stuff. I would show them how to do things, but I would look up the phrase. I would do this the night before. When I knew what we had to do the following day, I would compose all these phrases and... Uh, and I would say I'm in Korean, and oh, these guys were impressed that I could do that, and they really liked me. One one of the weird is a funny thing, kind of an aside, is they could not say my name. They could not say Steve. The V sound was foreign to them, and S T that was impossible for them. So I became Mr. Slipu. <laughs> Mr. Slipu. Yeah, and what, another thing they do is they. For a man, they put Mr. in front of your name, whether it's your first name or your last mm. name. You're Mr. Even and if each you're one a decan, them, you're like the lowest worker, you're still Mr. Yeah, they, and each one of them, well, they were Mr. They were Mr. Shin, Mr. Kang, Mr. Bear. And I called them that by their names, Mr. And uh, I taught them a lot of things, and they actually taught me a lot of things as well. And uh, I... The, the verbs in Korean are almost all of them end in hada, a d a hada, and like to say thank you, you say komsam nira. It's komsam nihada. Mm -hmm. It means I give you thanks, komsam nira. So you say that a lot. Okay. And uh, I forget which one is which, but there was one for clean and one for paint, and I think the the clean one might have been uh, chilhada. So okay. you point at something and you say chilhada, and they know that paint, clean that. Okay. And there was another one with a hada ending means paint that, and another one for fix that. And I had a whole lexicon of Korean right. verbs, so I could point and say the hada word, and they knew what I was talking about, and. Uh, I knew what they were talking about most of the time. I, I, so we got along very well. Okay, well, there was one story that I heard. Tell me if this is true, that one of the workers didn't want to work. And so one of the Koreans told the guy a bunch of stuff in Korean, and then he worked really hard. You remember this story? No, that was actually on the the first long line boat I went on. Oh, a different Smokey boat. Smokey Oshiro's boat. Smokey was uh, he was Okinawan, but born and raised in Hawaii, but Okinawan. So he went to Okinawa to find wives. He, I think he married about four different Okinawan women okay. and burned them out, and they ended up going back. And he went to Okinawa and hired some fishermen. And uh, he had hired about you know, two or three guys and he was going to try them out, and whichever ones worked out, he would keep them and send the others back. And <clears throat> in the middle of a fishing trip, one of these guys quit. He just refused to work. And George, or Smokey, went into the where the bunks were, 
when this guy was laying in the bunk doing nothing. He went in there and yelled at him. And uh, then he came out and he said, Steve, I want you to go in there and talk to this guy. And I said, how am I going to talk to him? I don't know any Okinawan words or Japanese words. And he said, just go in there and say anything. It doesn't matter. But we have these little gaffs, hand gaffs for move, moving mm -hmm. fish around. And he said, take this with you when you go. Just hold it. Don't do anything. Just hold it. And go in there, yell at him in English, and then come out. So, yeah, I went in there and I had this gaff in my hand, and I said, hey, you lazy bastard. Smokey wants you back on the deck to work, and you better get out there. He's really pissed off. So, you know, get your skinny, lazy ass out there and go back to work. And he looked at me, and his eyes got <laughs> real big. And uh, he followed me back out on the deck, and he went to work, and he never squawked about it again. Till the end of the trip, he left. But all during the rest of that trip, he didn't leave. So I asked Smokey, what did you tell him anyway? And he says, I told him that if he didn't get back to work, that the big American man, the howling man, is going to kill you. <laughs> and he believed and it. And he believed it. Jesus. And I went in there when I yelled at him. He thought I was threatening to kill him. And <laughs> so he went back to work gladly. It was very funny. Very funny. So tell me about tell me about the time how you got your nickname Devo. Oh yeah. Okay. When I was on Easy Rider, we were a commercial fishing boat, but we were also a charter boat. We were licensed to do charters, and we did a lot of charters for the scientific community. And the scientists liked us because the boat was actually originally a luxury fishing yacht converted to a commercial fishing boat. So it had several little cabins, and uh, each one had its own shower and toilet, and it, they always hired good cooks, and they always had great food. So the scientists liked going out on the Easy Rider, so uh, they got a lot of contracts with the government, with National okay. Marine Fisheries Service especially. Right? And with the state department, were, were they like they were like counting counting the catch and observing, or you were no, taking no, them they somewhere? would do their own thing. They oh, would, okay. We had nothing to do with it. Okay. My job at that time was they had a whole bunch of zodiacs, those little inflatable boats mm -hmm. with outboard motors on them. One of my jobs was to keep the zodiacs in repair, to keep the motors going, and to get those ready every morning to go out. They do whatever they want to do, mm -hmm. and also uh, keep their scuba bottles full. We had a pump to fill up their scuba bottles, so okay. I filled all their scuba tanks uh, the night before, and I made sure the zodiacs were were perfect. So, okay. Uh, we and, and then they were just going out and doing whatever their research projects were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, anyway, we did one trip where we visited every island in the. Northwest Hawaiian Island chain, which is it's about 1,200 miles long, and it consists of a whole bunch of uninhabited islands, atolls, and reefs. Uh, starts out with uh, Nihoa, which is the next island after Kauai, if you go northwest. And then there's an island called Necker. There's an island called Gardner Pinnacles, which are just the mm -hmm. leftover tips of islands. And then there's a big reef called Morrow Reef, which is actually a big atoll, and then Pearl and Hermes Reef, and then Midway Island, and then, uh, I forget the name of the last one. Anyway, there's a whole chain of these islands. The, the scientists wanted us to stop at every island. They would collect all the data they wanted, and then they would move on. And the trip would take generally about a month. But the scientists, they could handle, most of them anyway, could handle a month at sea, but two months, no. They couldn't take that. It was too much for them. So uh, there was an airstrip at Midway. Midway was an Air Force base, mm -hmm. military base. So the new team of scientists would fly in uh, to Midway and wait our arrival. And when we got there, they would change. The group of scientists we took up there would get off and fly back to Honolulu. The new group of scientists would get on. And for the return trip, 
doing the same thing their colleagues did on the way up. And we got a lecture when we landed there. The head of security at Midway came aboard and introduced himself and told us a little bit about Midway and what they did there. And he said, I only have two real rules for you guys. Uh, you can go anywhere you want. You can shop at our PX. You can eat in our restaurant. You can go to our nightclub. But you're not allowed to go to the Antenna Farm, and you're not allowed to go to Area 47. And so Antenna Farm, that was an easy one. They had microwave antennas there. If you went in there, your brain would be fried, like a giant microwave oven. Mm -hmm. Nobody was allowed in there except if they shut it down and they were doing repairs. Right. Area 47, they wouldn't tell us what it was. They said, it's posted, just don't. Just You'll don't see go the there. signs, just don't go there. So one of the guys that worked on the Easy Rider and I were walking around looking at things and we found Area 47 and we asked some of the enlisted guys what that was. And they laughed and they said, you don't know? Said, no. <laughs> we were told we're not allowed to go there, but what is it? He said, oh, that's the single ladies' barracks. You're not allowed to go there. He said, whoa. Well, and that's is there a, a way, the first place you went. <laughs> is there a way to go there? And they said, yeah, we'll take you there. We just have to do it at night and you have to be quiet about it and don't mm -hmm. tell anybody. So we went back to the boat and then... Uh, I don't know if it was that night or the next night. We just, this guy's name was Greg. Greg and I decided we wanted to see the single ladies' barracks. So we find these guys, and they took us to the single ladies' barracks. And uh, they said they didn't want to go in this time, but they got us in there. And said, like, well, good luck. So we go in there, and there's a party going on. There's all the single ladies, and there's a lot of the enlisted men that snuck in there mm -hmm. and they're playing music, they're drinking, they're dancing, they're making their own liaisons. And so Greg and I spent the night there and you know, we had a good time. You can imagine, seeing yeah. the ladies. On, a, on an island in the middle of the Pacific. Yeah, where guys <laughs> are you know, they're posted there for a year, no female yeah. companions. Same with the women. Yeah. No men, so they're going to violate the rules, of course. Yeah. And uh, by coincidence, when we got back to the boat, uh, they were looking for us. By the way, the MPs were looking for us. Uh, there was a island-wide hunt for the two guys that were missing. And somehow we escaped their scrutiny and we got back to the boat without being caught. But the guys on the boat knew where we were because mm. we'd already told them. Yeah. And then, a little while later, the bus came with the new load of scientists. And the scientists all lined up, and they meet us one at a time. And we go down the line, we shake hands with each one of them, and they tell who they are, we tell who we are. And when I got to the very first one, it was a, a, a fishery scientist, his name was Jimmy, and uh, I met him, and he's he told me his name, and I started to tell him my name, and one of the guys on the Easy Rider boat said, that's not true, his name is Devo. Devo, like in de-evolution. And the Jimmy, the scientist, looked mm -hmm. at me and he said, Devo? And I started to say something, and then Chip yelled out real loud, yeah, Devo, D-E-V-O, that's his name, Devo. And he shook my hand. He said, well, Devo, nice <laughs> to meet you. And I went down the line, and I met each one of them. And they knew my name because he yelled it out. He said, oh, Devo, I'm John. Oh, Devo, how do you do? I'm Fred. And uh, got down to the end of the line, and by then, I was Devo. So de-evolution, because yeah, you were a degenerate. And, that, and also the musical group, Devo. Yeah. Yeah, but de-evolution. Yeah, yeah, because you were a degenerate and you yeah, broke the rules. Yeah, degenerate, devolved into something horrible. And and this nickname stuck for the rest of your the fishing career. It's still with me. Still. I got a phone call two days ago from my ex-boss at Fresh Island Fish. He says, hello, Devo, it's Bruce. Hmm. So, yeah. It's still... To some people, I am still Devo. A lot of my friends in Hawaii still call me Devo. Uh, okay. The name never followed me. 
to the South Pacific, except for people that were from Hawaii, like my friend David Tano. He still calls me Devo. But the people I know where I worked after that, no, I was when you else. When you went to work for the French government, you wanted to hide no, your I never past. worked for the French for, government. The, for Fresh Island. I mean, not for the South Pacific Commission. Yeah, that's... That's an NGO. An NGO, non-government organization, oh. yeah. I, then I became uh, uh, Captain Beaver for a while. And, and, and you worked for them for 20 years, right? About 15, but... I did yeah. consultancy work. It all added up to about twenty years. Yeah. So the so the South Pacific Commission was set up after World War II to aid the South Pacific Islanders. For yeah, yeah. Because all the South Pacific Islands, they were all victims. They were invaded and colonized by the Japanese, and then they were uh, they were released from their captors by the Americans, and uh, they got the shit blown out of them in the the course of that happening. And they had, a lot of them had nothing. And they had no chances of developing anything unless they got some help. Mm -hmm. And that, the South Com Pacific Commission was there to help them. And it was Australia, New Zealand, United States, uh, England, France. And originally, I can't remember who else, but a bunch of countries that were on the winning side of World War II stepped in and decided to help them. And they helped them by, they had different branches, they had fisheries, they had agriculture, they had uh, a woman's branch. Uh, and, and this, they still do the same They stuff still too. do the same thing, but they <clears throat> they renamed themselves. They are now the, they're not the South Pacific Commission, they are the Secretariat of the Pacific Community. Okay. Because in reality, 90% of the countries were not in the South Pacific. Uh, oh, that, that they gave aid to. Yeah, they were, they were in the um, North Pacific. Not 90, sure. but 50, okay. 50. But years. just out of curiosity, mm. could, you, could you list off, you don't have to think of every single place, but can you list off the highlights of where you've been, like Kiribati and Cook Islands and Marshall Islands you've been to and Australia yeah, and New Zealand? Well, every, you've been, easier to say the ones I haven't been to. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it. There's only one South Pacific Commission country that I haven't been to. I've been to all of them. Niue, Cook Islands, uh, Fiji, Tonga, uh, Solomon Islands, uh, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea. Uh, every one of the four states in the uh, Federated States of Micronesia, uh, Guam, the, and the islands north of that, the CNMI, which means the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas Islands, Palau. I've been to all, been to all of those places and worked in all of them. Wow, that's a lot of places. Yeah. In when when you when you stopped in um, New Zealand though, that was before this. Job. This was like yeah, yeah. fishing. My first trip to New Zealand was in 1986, and you were on uh, a longline boat or no, a deep sea. Got on an air, airplane and rented the camper. My first job was I had, I had just lost my job uh, working on tugboats, and it was a company called American Work Boats, and uh, I lost that job, so I was in between jobs and nothing to do. And my friend Gary Solar called me up and asked me what I was doing, and I said, nothing. He said, you want to go to New Zealand? And he sa I said, yeah. And he said, well, let's go. And I said, I don't have any money. I don't have a job. And he said, I got money. Now, it turns out that Gary was married to a very nice lady named Barbara, who was a set director on a whole bunch of different movies, and she was a member of the Screen Actors Guild. And uh, she passed away, sadly, she had cancer. And she left Gary in her well, so one day he got a call from a lawyer, and said, where do you want me to send the check? And he inherited a bunch of money, and so he lived on Maui at the time. So he mm -hmm. flew over to Honolulu, and. He got a ticket to New Zealand, I got a ticket to New Zealand, and we went to New Zealand, and 
we rented a camper van and we spent a little over a month cruising around New Zealand. And it was, wow. it was a real eye-opening trip. I, aside from going to Mexico a few times, I had never been to a foreign country. Wow. And uh, I really loved it. It was great. It was a great trip. We had really had a good time there. So that that was before you had you had traveled for work and before you had expatted. Yeah, I so never, that was your first. I never even knew about those places. I wow. never even knew about the, what an expat was or an NGO was. I didn't know, and I certainly didn't know what New Caledonia was. I'd never heard of it. Yeah, well, like most people now. Yeah, today. I don't think most people know what New Caledonia <clears throat> is. Um, well, that's an, an interesting thing to me is because when I talked to David, you know, who's now in Bali. Your brother. It, yeah, my brother. Um, we were talking about people's fears about moving away from America and how most people never even consider it. But it's, in, in our family, we have, you've been an expat now over 30 years. And I've yeah. been an expat now going on seven years and he's been an expat well he went back to the states for a while but all told he's been an expat plus probably 20 years plus right yeah Something so like that, yeah. well so that's kind of unusual and <clears throat> and one of the things i always tell people about moving to mexico is you just don't know what you don't know you don't know what you can't know um when you when you first moved to when you first got a job in new caledonia it wasn't necessarily you were trying to moved to New Caledonia, right? Mm. It's just the opportunity of the job, I'm assuming. Like nobody in there, nobody just wakes up one day and says, I'm going to expat to New Caledonia. Yeah, no, it, it wasn't <laughs> like that at all. It was, it, my favorite word in the English language is serendipity. And serendipity mm -hmm. has been my, the theme of my life. Uh, if you don't know what serendipity means, it's an Arabian word. It means... Good things happen when you least expect them. And uh, the country of Sri Lanka, which was Ceylon, uh, part of India, and then they mm -hmm. had a civil war and they broke away and became independent. Uh, in the beginning, uh, they called themselves Serendip. And then eventually they called themselves Sri Lanka but they were serendip for a while. Hmm. Serendipity is a big theme in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, anyway, serendipitous events have happened in my life often. It's kind of weird, but they do happen. And uh, well, the other, the other meaning of the word, because I think, in fact, I know for a fact, you're the one that taught me about this word. And the other, the other thing behind the word is that, that that it's without agency so when i used to be a christian i used to think that god would arrange things or if something good happened it was a blessing from god or if something bad happened it was because i wasn't being good enough and so so, so I, I i also like the word serendipity because after you told me about it and then over my leaving religion <clears throat> and coming in to realize that a lot of good things like meeting my girlfriend or or ending up in Guadalajara of all the cities. Like I, when I decided I was going to expat, I didn't know where in Mexico. And of course, Mexico is a big country with many states, just like America and many different types of places. Guadalajara turns out to be one of the best cities in the world. It's just amazing. It's to, it was total serendipity why I ended up there. So mm. I get the word and I, and I like to use it. Okay. Testing one, two. Okay, we were talking about, <clears throat> we're talking about serendipity. I think the most serendipitous thing that happened to you is you met my mom at a pool. Otherwise, I wouldn't exist. No, that wasn't exactly serendipity. That was no. a planned thing. How do you plan it? Well, it was planned by uh, your uncle Tony. Oh, basically, so you were set up. You were kind of in no, introduced. No, no, that's not. You want me to tell the yeah. story, or do you want to tell it? I want you to tell it. Go ahead. Okay, then stop telling it. All right. Uh, yeah, I was a lifeguard at the Elks Club in Waikiki in, uh, well, from the first year I got to Hawaii in 1963 and then until 1965, so about two and a half years, excuse me, and uh, I became friends with the son of one of the members there, the, the Grays, their son was Tony, he used to hang around. 
and he was he was too young to hang around with the the older teenagers and he was too old to hang around with the kids so there weren't very many people for him to talk with so he used to follow me around and talk to me uh, sometimes he'd be a little bit pesty but most of the time he was interesting to talk to because he did a lot of bizarre things in his life anyway one day he told me that he had a 17 year old sister and I said Wow, really? Is she pretty? And he said, yeah, yeah, she's pretty. I said, oh, I want to meet her. He said, okay. So the next weekend, I worked during school year. I worked there on weekends only. Mm -hmm. The next uh, weekend, Tony came and got me, and he said, oh, come and meet my sister. So I followed him, and there were two pretty young girls sitting on a blanket underneath the coconut tree. One was Michael's mother. Leslie and another was her friend, Barb Holmes. So I was introduced to them and then voila, lots of things happened after that. Wow. That's yeah. a whole other story. And then I came along and my brother and sister. Yep. Okay, so <clears throat> so let's go back to things that are serendipitous. Can you give me some good examples in your life that, that were like just people wouldn't almost believe the story? Yeah, meeting my present wife, Ratna. Uh, I was still working at the, the South Pacific Commission at the time. I think they maybe already changed their name. But on the campus there, they call it, it's a real nice place, a beautiful place across the street from the, from the beach. And it's got, uh, got a big meeting room, a library, and a whole bunch of offices, and two bars. One is like a sort of a family bar uh, dining area, and one is more like just a bar. And the bar is, that's up in the front. And that mm -hmm. bar is set up for when they have big meetings with a lot of different uh, representatives from different countries there. Uh, it's a place to be congenial with those people and for the, the people that work there to get to know the people that are visiting from other countries. And they use it for other things as well, too. And one day, uh, the wife of one of my colleagues came to me and said, Steve, I need you to help me if you don't mind. And I said, yeah, what? Her name's Andrea. I said, well, what, Andrea? And she said, uh, I'm having for all this week, or next week it was, she's talking about the, the week to come. So she's having... Ladies from New Caledonia uh, come to SPC and learn English, or if they already know English, to practice it more, mm -hmm. to get better at English. And every day at 10 o'clock, which coincided with the time when the normal people there, the, not normal, the people that work there usually have a break from 10 to 10.30, so it will coincide with that. So what I'm asking you to do is to please help us. You're an English speaker, so uh, give up your, your tea break and come to the bar in the front and talk to these ladies. Just they'll, mm -hmm. they'll have some format for it. And uh, I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And a lot of the, pe the people she asked, the other people in the fisheries department said no. Well, I said yes. I was one of the few that said yes. So Monday came around, 10 o'clock. I go to the bar, and I walk in, and there, there's no helper fisheries person in there yet. And uh, anyway, I look around, and I see a table. And what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to go sit at the table and talk to whoever is sitting there, the lady that's sitting there. Mm -hmm. I look around and I see this very pretty lady. And I, so I go and ask her, can I sit here? And she said, yes. So I sit down and then she's, I have a list of questions and she has a list. And we're, that's what we're supposed to talk about. Things like, uh, what, what do you do for a living? Uh, what kind of car do you drive? What's your favorite movie? Just things you'd find in the English French textbook. Sure. 
So the first question I asked her, well, I noticed right away that she was beautiful. And the first question I asked her was, are you married? And she looks at the paper and she makes a face and she said, that's not one of the questions. <laughs> and, I, and she says, no, by the way, no. And I said, well, do you have a boyfriend? Said, That's not one of the questions mm -hmm. either. Uh, no. Do you have any kids? And she said, yes. She said, but why are you asking these questions? They're not on the list. I said, how do you know, really? And she said, because I wrote the list. <laughs> I wrote the question. I said, yeah. oh, oh, okay, well. And then I continued to mm -hmm. violate the rules and ask her uh, questions. Because we were told not to flirt with the students, by the way, which I was doing. And uh, that afternoon, I told a couple of my friends, why wow, you guys should have gone there, man. There were lots of women there. And, some of them, not all of them, some of them were young and pretty and, you know, good opportunity to meet somebody. I, I met this really beautiful Indonesian lady. And uh, so the next day, I show up a bit early, which was a smart thing to do, and I sit down at Rotten's table, and one of my friends, Peter, comes and sits down next to me, and I look at him and I say, hey, Peter, fuck off. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, you heard me, fuck off, get out of here. Go sit somewhere else. So he did, but he, he was kind of mad about it. And then uh, Ratna and I talked. We were the only ones at the table. We talked some more. And then a, a strange thing happened. The next day, uh, I went and sat down, and one of the girls, one of the students, came and sat, and uh, Ratna looked at her and said, fuck off. <laughs> So now, that to was, me, that was, that, that was serendipity. And that was the beginning of the romance. Yeah, and by Friday, we were in love and, you know. And what was this, 25 years ago or 20? 20, 20, 1999, 25 wow. years ago. Wow. And you're still In fact, it was March 19th, 1999. Wow. I remember it because my 55th birthday was three days before that. Wow. Time flies. But that was a bit serendipitous, me saying, yes, I'll do that, and then going there and meeting my future wife. Yeah, that is true. That is true. What about, um, uh, give me a serendipitous story about ending up working in some bizarre place that turned out to be really cool, or you learned something, or had an experience you, you maybe even as a, could have been really tragic, but you got rescued or something. Like, for instance... Um, you were on Pitcairn Island. How many people ever go to Pitcairn Island? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty Pit, crazy. Pitcairn Island, was, that was uh, before SBC. I was, <clears throat> I got a job with a company in Hawaii, uh, Fresh Island Fish, the company I still work for now. Mm -hmm. that, that was years ago. It was 1986. I worked for them. I was a crew on a fishing boat. And... Uh, Uh, let's see now. How did this happen? Oh yeah, I, I. One of the reasons I wanted to work for them is I knew that they were going to go to Fiji, with a joint venture kind of a thing with the with a company down there, or a couple of companies, and I had never been to Fiji, but I'd heard about it and I wanted to travel. So, mm -hmm. uh, the only place I'd ever been was New Zealand, but. A chance to go to Fiji? Yeah, I'll take that. So uh, I did. I went to Fiji. And then uh, we were only there for a couple of months, and then there was a military coup. There was an election and then a coup. And uh, things got really weird. Uh, most people, most expats, most Caucasians, any other foreigner, they had to leave. They didn't have to, but they chose to leave. So the, the population went from 20% expats to 5% expats overnight. These people just got out. They were afraid because mm -hmm. there were soldiers walking around with machine guns and, uh, you know, didn't look good. So I ended up uh, staying there 
during the coup and working, but uh, an opportunity came up, and this was serendipity. There was a boat on the shipyard there, up on the hard, they call it, when a boat's out of the water. And I went up to them and talked to them and met the owner, captain, and uh, asked him what they were doing there, why they were there during the coup. And said, well, they had nothing to do with that. They didn't know it was coming. But they bought this, they had bought this boat. Uh, it used to be a, a pole and line boat for skipjack tuna. Then it became something else. So they were fishing for uh, what they called giant clams. And then it was up on the hard and for sale. So they bought it with the idea they were gonna, they were going to convert it to a lobster boat and take it to Australia. So I asked if they were looking for any crew members, and I told them my background. And uh, yeah, the, the funny thing, they hired me as a cook. <laughs> so that fi meeting them and going away with them, that was serendipitous. So I left not too long after the coup started, and uh, our first stop was Australia. I stayed there for a while. And then the next stop after that was New Zealand and ended up spending about two years in New Zealand and making a few trips on the boat, but most of the time on land in New Zealand. So that, that what, was... What are you working on when you're a fishing boat and on land? Working on the boat. Oh, working on the boat. Yeah. Getting yeah. it ready the, the to The work fish. on the boat never ends. And this was a lobster boat. They had converted it to a lobster boat. Okay. So you're in New Zealand. I'm assuming you're, you're docked in Auckland, right? That's the port? No, Rome? Mount Maunganui. Okay. That's on the South and, Island? Uh, yeah. No, it's in North Island. Mount Maunganui. Okay. Mount Maunganui and the place above that, man, I just can't remember the name of it now. There's a river that goes through there uh, and flows out into the sea, and there's these sort of two twin towns that are separated by this river. Uh, eventually they built a bridge to connect them, but when I was there, the only way to get from one to the other was by a ferry boat. Uh, man, why can't I... Yeah, don't worry about it. Why I, can't I remember? I, I can't remember shit half the time of names. Yeah. It, it'll, come to, I, I, it'll come to you at an inconvenient time. I was there for almost two years, so I should remember wow. it. So. Now, they must have been hemorrhaging money like crazy. Yeah, but they had a Japanese partner that had a lot of money. Okay, so you get the boat eventually working, and you work this boat. Yeah, I worked and on it. We no, I mean you fished. You fished. You, I didn't. Uh, you did. Yeah, we fished. We tried to. It was a a failure basically, and uh, I ended up leaving. I went back to Hawaii, and when I got back to Hawaii, I saw. Uh, the new long line boats that use monofilament line on a reel, mm -hmm. something I'd never even heard of. So I, uh, I typed up a, a resume, what they call a CV, curriculum vitae, and I walked from one end of where the harbors were all the way to the other end, and I stopped at every boat that looked like a possibility and asked for a job. And eventually I got one. I got offered a job on a boat. And my first trip on that boat, I made more money than I had made on that boat that I got on in Fiji in two years. One trip, wow. 10 days, I made more money. So wow. that was for me. That's how this, I got hooked on long line fishing. And this was the heyday of, of sushi and tunas were high priced. And it's still, it's still, still going on. It's still yeah. going on. Okay. Nothing's so, changing. And you started off as a crewman or were you cooking? Yeah, well, or crew. Crew. And you worked your way up. Okay, we skipped over the part of how you ended up in Pitcairn Island. This is before Hawaii, obviously. Oh, yeah. Pitcairn Island was that boat uh, that I got on in Fiji. We went to Australia and spent about four months there in the shipyard doing some repair work and then took off and went to New Zealand, and then they were trying to decide what to do with the, the owner, captain owner, part owner of the boat, decided he wanted to go to Pitcairn Island because he read about it and read that there were lots of lobsters there. 
So, anyway. Oh, so you actually we went, went there to work or to fish? Yeah, yeah, we went there uh, to fish. Wait, what in what territory was that? Was that is that British? Pitcairn Island, uh, loosely associated with with Britain, but then after that, loosely associated with New Zealand. Interesting, and but I mean, it's still just a really tiny place. People still live there, but it's not. yeah. There's a little over fifty people live there. Wow. Descendants of the mutiny on the boundary uh, story. Descendants of Mel Gibson, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. No, the main yeah one Fletcher was, Christian, right? That's their name. Yeah, but I'm saying Fletcher Christian was the Mel Gibson character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they were they were Christians, and they all had. They went back to Tahiti and got their Tahitian girlfriends and looked around for a place to run away to. And they found that island. By, that was serendipity. Mm -hmm. They found Pitcher Island and they, they burnt the bounty, and get rid of the evidence. And, and then they killed all, then the men all killed each other eventually, right? No, or, not exactly. They, yeah, they did. They left one, there was one man left standing, John Adams. And he saved the place, and uh, he used the he took the the Bible off of the the bounty, okay. the ship that they had, and he used that to teach all the people how to read and write and speak English. And did they believe, or was it just for just for learning? I have no idea. Hmm. And the. And the Captain Blythe, you once told me he was one of the greatest navigators in the history of the oh, world yeah. because he, he got thrown when they did the bounty, the mutiny. They they didn't kill him. They sent him in a little rowboat. And he, yeah, he, not a little rowboat, really. They sent him in a, it's kind of a big boat. They, half of the crew went along with the mutiny, half didn't. So uh, Captain Blythe set off in an open boat with minimum uh, supplies to go wherever he wanted to go, and he headed west, uh, and he ended up, uh, let's see, where did he end up? I can't remember. Might have been Indonesia. Yeah, anyway, he went through Fiji and... No, he eventually went, he eventually went back to England and there was like a, yeah. a trial and Yeah, he so went forth. back to England, told his story, and then they hired him to go and look for the, the mutineers and to arrest them and bring them back to England. It was, never happened. Never happened. It was too far, too, too far gone. Yeah. But what's interesting is, is <clears throat> I once saw a map um, when, Captain Cook, when Captain Cook discovered the Hawaiian Islands and, and mapped them. His, one of his lieutenants or first mate was Bly. Oh yeah, yeah. It could have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was it, it was it's a super super interesting story. So, so I would say there's very few people in the world that have been to the number of islands in the Pacific that you've traveled to. I mean, that's pretty. That's probably would, a good assessment. Yeah, <laughs> I would say that's not. Now, you also did a trip once to Etretia, which is another fascinating story. For where Etretia? Eritrea. Eritrea. How do you say it? Eritrea. 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 Eritrea is in North Africa. It's on the Horn of Africa. Okay, so why did you go there to work? What did you? What were you teaching people to do? Well, at the time I was with SPC, and a company in Hawaii, Pacific Ocean Producers, had sold a bunch of longline systems, reels and everything else, to a company in Eritrea, and it was actually an Australian company. That's that's a whole other story, how they got there. But they wanted somebody that knew longline fishing to go there and to teach the people there longline fishing, uh, using the boats that they were making. So basically, they were boat builders. They weren't fishermen. Okay. So I went there, and that that was my job. And you were training crew. Like, did they take local crews? But they had yeah, Australian had to, be, no, had to be local no, crews. All local. All locals. Yes. Okay. And so your job was to train them how to use the, the gear and the fishing techniques too. Yeah, everything. The whole yeah. shot. It, that ended up not happening because they didn't look into it very well. The water there, the Red Sea, the deepest water was, I think it was, uh, might have been three hundred fathoms. The very deepest, not nearly deep enough to go longline fishing for tunas 
And there are no Tina populations in the Red Sea. <laughs> they didn't bother to check that first? No, they didn't bother. <laughs> they didn't care. They were making boats and selling boats. Oh, so they were just selling the boats. Yeah, care. yeah. Now, I remember you telling me during this time the, the they were in a civil war, or they were in a war with Ethiopia. They were in a war with Ethiopia, yeah. And the... And so tell me about tell me about the the French pilots told you to not worry they no, they were uh, Romanian oh Romanian pilots yes uh, there was only one airline that went there it was called Red Sea Air it was owned by an Arabian a Saudi Arabian but the crew were all from Romania because there were no Saudi Arabians that knew how to fly airplanes so the Romanians were also hired by Ethiopia to run their air force. So one of their jobs was to bomb Eritrea. So whenever they were sent on a mission to bomb, they would call uh, somebody in Red Sea Air and tell them exactly where they were going to bomb so they would get all the airplanes out of there and all the people. Hmm. And then the Romanian guys would always miss <laughs> And never hit their targets. It was just, it was a stupid war. So it was, it was just mostly for show, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And you were there what a few months, and then you went yeah, back to yeah. New Caledonia. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was only it was a. Were you ever scared of? of no. It was so it was pretty safe. What? Tell me tell me when you were the most in danger or scared in one of these trips. There must have been a time where you thought you're going to die. You're at sea, or you're in a, in a. A riot or something? Uh, no, I'd have to be weather, bad weather. Like 12-foot surf or something? No, bigger than that. 30-foot swells. And you were the captain or crew? Either one. It didn't matter. Mm. The ship goes down, you go down with it. Well, but I'm saying, if you're the if you're the captain... Oh, I close this thing. I don't care the battery's low. If you're... Well, if you're the captain, you're more in control of your fate, I guess. As opposed to being a crew? Well, you're not in charge of the weather. No, I understand that, but but you're more in charge of how the boat is being directed, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Is that, is that a better position to be in as opposed to being it at the mercy of... It depends on the competence of the person who is in charge. You have to trust them. Yeah. They have more experience than you, more knowledge. Uh, you trust them. They've been in that situation before. You have to trust them. Well, obviously, you made it through each one of these. I made what? You made it through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, so, is it what is is that that old saying that being at sea is the like endless boredom and then extreme fear yeah, for your yeah, life? Yeah, That's yeah. kind of a true statement. Being bored for 95 percent of the time and then five percent of the time being terrified. So something like that. So I went I went longline fishing with you once. Mm. It was a three week trip. And you yeah. told me, this will be the hardest work you ever do, and after this, everything you do in your life will be easy in yeah, comparison. it's about right. Yeah, it was mostly true. It was pretty brutal. Because you're working, I mean, you're on the boat 24 hours a day. You can't go anywhere. You're either working, sleeping, or eating, or, yeah. or fixing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty hard work. I mean, um, I guess I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to do that for a, a career. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> In your in your travels, um, you learned to say the Hawaiian prayer. So when you were in places like Tonga and Fiji or whatever, I, you were, you I were, made that up. You made you made that up. That was a bullshit story. Of course, Jesus, Dad. You want me to translate it for you? <laughs> yeah, let me hear. Yeah, well, now I want to hear okay, the real I'll story. Say, okay, the, the, somebody asked me to say a prayer once, and I'm not religious, so I don't know any of their prayers. So I did it, I did it in Hawaiian, and they were really impressed. This was at South Pacific Commission. Okay. They were really impressed because I could say a prayer in, in Hawaiian, and it really doesn't matter because nobody's listening anyway. Right. I mean, you know, there's no God looking down. Oh, yeah. wow, that guy's good. Okay, I say, Komo mai kanaka, which means come in men. Komo mai wahini, come in ladies. Komo mai keiki, come in kids and I say aloha no vau ia oi kako I love everybody here and then I say 
Umalki Eoka and Ikikaioka Pono, which means it's a, my variation of the state motto, which is the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. It's on the state seal, but I change it to the, the life of the sea is perpetuated in righteousness. Mm. And then I say, Haina uh, Mayana Kapoanala. That's my story. But I also, I've added to that. I say, Mahalo Nui Loa Almakua. Thank you very much, God. And Mahalo Nui Loa, Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, Jesus Christ. And then I say, sometimes, it varies. Every time I say it, it's a little bit different. I say, Pehakapiko Jesus. Literally, that means, how's your belly button? But it's a way Hawaiians said, hello, how are you? How's your belly button? Peheo Kapiko. Really? Yeah. I never knew that. And then I would say, uh, then I would say that's the end of my story. Haina Mayana Kapo Wanana. And then I would say, Haolila now, Jesus Christ. Happy birthday, Jesus. And then Amen, which is Amene. So they're real words and they have meaning and they mean as much as any other prayer. Oh, and I'm sure people are impressed. Oh, yeah, they were. They were. <laughs> Very good. That my the, the favorite prayer that I ever heard you tell me about was when when uh, Fred and Sharon prayed to Jesus, and you're like, wait a minute, I want my turn, and you prayed to Satan. You remember no, that? No, it was, it was Fred. <laughs> it was a family reunion at uh, Reno, and uh, the family reunion had two goals, a family reunion, and also, we had relatives we didn't know we had. My mother had a half-sister she never told us about. Interesting. Why, I don't know. So we had an aunt we didn't even know existed. So she was invited along with her kids who were old, grown-up mm -hmm. adults with kids of their own. We, so we had cousins we didn't even know about. So part of the reason for this family reunion is for us to get to know them. Uh, Anyway, when the family reunion started, uh, da David and I had just gotten back from Spain, from a uh, fisheries expo there. And uh, first thing we did was uh, we went and bought a bottle of Johnny Walker Green to take the reunion, and we hit it pretty hard. So by the time it was our turn to talk, I was in the bag already. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I still was drinking. I don't drink anymore. Uh, anyway, we got in this big circle and Fred assigned himself the job of being the patriarch because he, he was the oldest living male sibling there. Uh, Louise, our sister, who was older than Fred, was she was the cook. So anyway, Fred got together and he had everybody in this circle, hold hands. And uh, he said we were all gonna introduce ourselves, but first we were gonna, uh, we were gonna say a prayer together and we were gonna invite Jesus. Oh, he invited Jesus to come to this meeting and meet us all too, so he did. <laughs> so when it came to my turn, I was about four people down from Fred I said, yeah, my name is Steve Beverly, and I'm, uh, I'm Steve and Esther's first offspring, and Fred is my half-brother, same mother, different father, and same with Louise and Doug, and then uh, my brother David is here, and anyway, I gotta tell you a little bit about myself and maybe some of the others here is that Fred invited Jesus and he opened this meeting with a, a call to Jesus to come and join us. Well, I have to tell you that we're not all Christians. Some of us, including myself, are devil worshipers. And so at this time, <laughs> I would like to invite the devil to come to this meeting and be with us. And I just heard this, all these moans, oh, mm -hmm. no, say it isn't so. And it, from that moment on, about maybe half the people there completely disowned me. And it was a joke, you know, but 
Some I, people maybe, get jokes, some people don't. Maybe it wasn't a joke, Dad. No, it was a joke. I told it. it you, was don't, a joke. you don't really believe in Satan? Come on. <laughs> well, what, what, um, in your in your many years of traveling and the different mm. uh, people's positions, religion, politics, and what is the one thing you had? It, what would you advise people that have a dogmatic position? It doesn't matter even if they're right. How would you how would you say? How would you give somebody advice if they were ap- if they were actually willing to say, you know what, maybe I'm not right, or maybe I could be wrong. Like if somebody has a little chink in their dogma. Like you don't want to just tell them to think what you think because then you're just being dogmatic like the other people. Mm. What would be what would be your advice? Yeah, I don't know. That's a hard one to answer. I, first of all, I don't I don't like to give advice. You are what you are, and you think what you think, and that's that's you. It's not for me to say. So. Uh, I don't tell people what religion to be or not to be or to have religion or don't have religion. I can tell them what I think, what my opinion is, and that's it. They're either interested or they're not, but I don't really care. That's my opinion. But what about your epistemology for it? Like it, like if you said, well, I, I'm, I'm an atheist because I figured out God was an asshole when I was seven... That's not a very... No, I like, didn't figure out God was an asshole. I asked the question, what kind of God would have two young boys, uh, rather have two young boys sit and listen to an old man rant in a stuffy, dusty, dirty building, or go to a little store and have ice cream and candy bars? I didn't say yeah. God was an asshole. Okay. I asked the question, what kind of God well, would do that? No, but I guess my point is maybe that God exists and he is an asshole. Well, it's your opinion. No, I'm not saying I believe that. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Yeah, but no, I didn't say that, and I didn't imply that. Okay, well, that's what I'm asking. What it, what what are you implying about about thinking about? Like, how do you, are you saying you just don't have free will, and your your beliefs are just how what they are, or have you thought through some? No, you you, know, you have free will, of course. Well, I don't know if it's a course. Yeah, no, people commit suicide. That's got to be free will. Maybe not. Maybe Unless had, somebody's poking a thing. Maybe they had no choice. Yourself. Maybe they had no choice. Maybe yeah, they're no, I don't believe that. Well, okay. Well, lots of smart people think that. To there's... be or not to be, that is the question. As uh, as Hamlet said in the Caesar, I mean the Shakespeare play. Okay. Um, have you have you stayed pretty apolitical? Like like. It's just I don't normal. mind giving my opinion if somebody wants to hear it, but no, they usually don't. So. People are pretty set in their ways. You're not going to change people's minds anyway. Yeah, that's the hard part. Well, but then if you can't change anyone's mind, then how do you get the idea we have free will? Like if your mind can't be changed, then that seems hard. No. You're just set in your ways how you're... I didn't say your mind can't be changed. Your mind can be changed. Okay, that's my question. But about how? politics, you're probably not going to change yeah. anybody's mind. Right. And that has nothing to do with free will. That has to be, at this point in the politics in America, it has to be whether you're stupid or not. <laughs> okay. Well, that's true. Well. If you're if you're stupid, then you're a Trumpster. You you think it'd be all right to have that r- raving maniac as the leader of the free world? If you're yeah. smart, you would probably think, no, that's not a good idea. Even though the the uh, the alternate choice, Joe Biden. What is he, a senile old man, and what is he going to do for us? So, yeah. I don't know the answer. And well, I'm, one, I'm not going to vote, so I don't care. Well, one time you to, one time that you told me you had you had to vote for the conservative French president just because pragmatic, it just made more sense. It was a pragmatic decision. For Sarkowski, you remember this? This is back when New Caledonia was still doing their little mini civil war th- or fights and riots and... You don't remember that? that? Well, do you remember you telling me that? They're like, oh, I got to, even though I don't necessarily agree with the politics, I'm going to be pragmatic. Uh, You forgot. I don't recall that. You drank too much from that point. Okay, what about living somewhere? What if somebody said, what if somebody said to you, "Um, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing to believe that, that living my whole life here in Downey or wherever it may be, Orange County or LA or, Des Moines, Iowa, 
and they maybe their brain is like fuck i'm missing out on life like they hear stories like my brother's story and my story and other expats um not i'm not asking you to what advice would you give but like what would you what would you give them as like an encouragement to try living outside the box uh i wouldn't give anything they've made their choice they live with it yeah okay well that's fair and enough the kind of people like there are people i went to high school with that have never left downey and that to me that's unbelievably stupid and uh unimaginative yeah. but it's their choice they want to do it they do it i don't care yeah well yeah. i don't even like driving by there on the freeway <laughs> i kind of turn my head away so i don't even have to look at it yeah uh don't, could you tell me the story of the time you you and your friends were going to rob the mcdonald's or something you remember that story no. you're like you guys used to send the person back to get a shake at the end but the guy knew you were the guy knew what you were going to do and you're like, yeah, what are you going to do? There was like four or five of us. And the guy looked at you and said, I'm coming after you. And that's when you decided no. not. You don't remember this story? No, that yeah. didn't happen. It didn't happen. You no, told me this story. No, not McDonald's. Oh, some other drive-in? Yeah, no, it wasn't even a drive-in. It was uh, where my sister lived in, uh, in Encinitas. A bunch of us went there and there wasn't room at her house for all of us. So my friends and I, John and Larry... We found these little cabins you could rent for the, it was just a cabin with a toilet. It was not much and it didn't cost very much either. So we could afford it. And you know, we went there to go surfing and to hang out and get free meals when we could from my sister who was kind of a cheap. You never knew if she was gonna kick in and give us a free meal or not. Anyway, we rented these little cabins and then there was a, a restaurant kind of, uh, a, a little teeny place real near there, and it was like the cook was the owner, and we went in, we sat at the counter, and we're eating and talking to the guy, told him our story, and then uh, one of us asked, uh, hey, what would happen if we just walked out of here and didn't pay, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to chase you. I'm going to chase you down and catch you. And I asked him a question that he didn't even think of. I said, yeah, you think you can run in three directions at once? <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, oh, no, oh, please don't do that. We didn't, and we had no intention of doing it. It was just a joke. Yeah, I don't know. When you told me the story... He said he would. You told me that he said he was going to come after you. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did say that because I said I brought that up. He that he can't. He can't go after. So he had to pick yeah, one. Yeah, he can't go after three. He picks one, and I'm the one. And you're the guy, huh? Yeah. Um, if you had, if you had to, um, if you could go back to, to go back in time and live in any country let's say your life was just different and you could live in any of the places that you visited say go back to be like 40 years old or something would you pick somewhere exotic like fiji or tonga or that's uh, an easy pick, question to answer what, what a lot of times people ask me of all the places you've been where would you like to live the most and i say well that's the wrong question you should ask when and the when is uh the early 1970s in Hawaii. That was the best time ever in my life. Hmm. And if I could go back then, I would go back then, but yeah. not possible, obviously. Well, yeah, obviously, yeah. And some of the differences are, uh, in the 19, early 1970s, you could walk down the middle of Waikiki on Kalakaua Avenue. From one end to the other, you would see not less than three people that you knew. Hmm friends or people that you went to school with or worked with. Now, the chances of seeing somebody you know in Waikiki are zero. Yeah. You don't see anybody you know. And worse than that, you don't see anybody you might want to know. It's, it's just wall-to-wall -wall tourists and yeah, expensive. Yeah, completely changed. Wall-to-wall -wall tourists and uh, ABC stores. Yeah. There were no ABC stores back then. 
Yeah, no, it was a great place, a great time. The, do you think there's a place like this today in another country that you just don't know about? Oh, no, there might be. But it's definitely, the world has definitely changed yeah. dramatically. Um, all right, Pop, well, let's wrap this up. Maybe I'll interview you again when I think of some more interesting stuff. But in closing, I know you, you turned 80 yesterday. I'm what? You turned 80 yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what advice do you have for people? You've lived 80 fucking years. Don't get old. <laughs> Fair enough. And yeah. the way to not get old is uh, make a pact with yourself. Like in that book, the guy that wrote, uh, oh man, I can't even think of it now. Steppenwolf, maybe. Uh, he made a pact with himself that if things didn't go the way he wanted them to go by the time he was, I think it was 40 or maybe 50, that he was going to commit suicide. So he had a way out. Hmm. So the way out is if you, when you get to 65, check out. Check out if you don't have, well, obviously you didn't do that, so you must have, you must have arranged yourself yeah, to there's always sort of a, the future. Yeah, I'm, a charmed, you've lived a, pretty much of a charmed life for know, the most part. Oh, you call this a charm? Well, now, I mean, now it's karma. You've got to pay the price now. No, I don't believe in <laughs> karma either, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Try to stay healthy. Yeah. Stay out of the sun, use sunscreen, wear a hat. Maybe don't do so much alcohol and drugs and parties yeah, and all yeah, that kind of shit. Yeah, that either, yeah. Live a little bit healthier. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's 50 million other questions that are super interesting. So if you think of something, let's do this again because I know there's more stuff you haven't told me. Oh, there's lots of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of stories, but we're both getting tired. Yeah. So let's call it a day. Okay. All right.